Greetings, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to this virtual discussion on protecting nonprofit organizations from terrorism financing abuse. My name is Tracy Derner. I'm the Chief of Programs at the Global Center on Cooperative Security. Uh, thank you all for joining us today from your respective time zones. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Um, for anyone who is joining that may not know us, the Global Center advances human rights-centered approaches to political violence, violent extremism, and injustice worldwide. One of our core areas of focus has been on financial integrity and inclusion, where we partner with government, civil society, and the private sector to advance risk-based approaches to anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism while safeguarding civic space. Uh, we have a very full panel today with some really exciting speakers that will be joining us. Um, so just a few couple housekeeping things to flag up front. Um, we are hoping to have time at the end of this discussion uh, for questions and to open the floor for interventions. I encourage you to use the raise hand feature to indicate your desire to take the floor. Uh, and you're also invited to submit any questions that you may have via the chat function. If you have any technical difficulties, please message my colleague Adele Westerhus via the chat function for support. She shows up here as Global Center. Okay, so I'm gonna start us off today with just giving some brief context on the current frameworks for protecting nonprofit organizations or NPOs from terrorism financing abuse. From there, we're gonna to turn to a number of esteemed colleagues who will provide further detail on the landscape within their respective regions and take a look at the future of the recommendation eight ahead. Much of today's discussion will focus around international standards put forward by the Financial Action Task Force or FATF and specifically its recommendation eight, which was revised last year. At its core, recommendation eight calls for five things. Firstly, for countries to identify the subset of organizations that meet FATF's definition of a nonprofit organization and may face risks for terrorism financing. Second, to have in place measures to mitigate those identified risks, to conduct outreach and engagement with nonprofit organizations, to have the necessary powers and procedures to investigate potential instances of terrorism financing abuse, and lastly, to share relevant information with foreign and domestic agencies in the context of such investigations. Now, I wanna be clear at the onset, Recommendation 8 is not the only framework that guides CFT, countering the financing of terrorism measures. Uh, and in fact, there are a number of legally binding ones, including Security Council Resolution 2462, which calls on states to ensure that measures that counter the financing of terrorism are comply with their obligations under international law, including international human rights, humanitarian and refugee law. We focus on FATF standards today, not because they're international law, they're not, they're just recommendations, but because FATF and its regional bodies publicly evaluate countries' compliance with their standards and they produce a public list of countries that they've found to have strategic compliance deficiencies. Being on this list can have economic repercussions for a country, which is often seen as mobilizing efforts to increase compliance and identify a specific gaps. So I'll ask Adele to just pull up a quick slide because I wanna start with giving just a sense of the global state of compliance with FATF recommendation eight. Thanks, Adele. So what you see here are the global findings of those evaluations that I mentioned. They're disaggregated by which FATF style regional body the country belongs to. The red bar indicates countries that are considered not compliant, yellow is partially compliant, green is largely compliant, and the dark green is fully compliant with recommendation eight. At the global level, recommendation eight has the lowest level of compliance of all of FATF's 40 recommendations. What that means, it has the second highest number of countries that are considered not compliant and the lowest number of countries considered fully compliant. There are nine currently. Um, but overall, the majority of countries are really falling somewhere in the middle. 37% are considered partially compliant while 36% 36, 36 are considered largely compliant. And as you can see in this chart, there are significant variations across the region. The slide shows the percentage of members in each compliance category. 
So it is a bit skewed for some of the smaller FATF style bodies, but in general, it paints a picture of compliance in different parts of the world. And there may be many reasons why a country can have compliance short hauls. These ratings don't always tell a complete story. And importantly, they don't necessarily take into consideration the negative consequences that CFT measures have on civic space, human rights, and access to financial services. CFT measures have been abused to target human rights defenders, freeze assets of civil society organizations, and resulted in the delays of transactions needed to deliver critical humanitarian assistance. In some cases, they've been misused or misapplied to result in limitations on freedom of expression and association, and to enable legal and administrative barriers that hinder the efficient and effective operations of civil society. In recognition of this, in February 2021, FATF launched a study to mitigate, uh, to, sorry, a project to study and mitigate the unintended consequences resulting from the incorrect implementation of its standards. One outcome of this process was a revision of Recommendation 8. It was considered a technical revision and that many of the core elements stayed the same, but the language was refined and clarified to address some common misperceptions. And I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to highlight some of those most notable changes. Adele, you can take the slide down. Thanks. So starting first, um, one of the most important changes was the inclusion of language in the standard itself that indicated that measures should be applied without unduly disrupting or discouraging legitimate NPO activities. This language had previously appeared in the evaluation criteria for Recommendation 8, specifically in how FATF was determining whether countries were effectively implementing that standard. But it now appears in the standard itself, which means that it's both a stronger component and considered when looking at technical compliance as well as effectiveness. There's also a slight change to the wording. It used to read legitimate charitable activities, but that was broadened to read legitimate nonprofit activities, reflecting that there is a wider range of organizations that don't provide charitable services, like advocacy organizations, for example, but whose operations still should not be affected by CFT measures. A second key change is around the wording of supervision. It's now referring to calls for oversight and monitoring. Other FATF standards call for authorities to adopt a risk-based approach to, supervi to supervising reporting entities. These are things like banks, casinos, real estate agents, but nonprofit organizations are different. And so the language of the standard was changed to reinforce that. Instead of calling it supervision, the terminology is now using oversight and monitoring, um, both of which still should be applied in a risk-based measure. Monitoring is described as being able to proactively detect and respond to significant changes in risk while oversight is considered to be less intrusive and less resource intensive. So therefore more appropriate with countries that have lower terrorism financing risks or NPOs that have lower terrorism financing risks. And one of the third big changes is around where information falls in the standard. There previously used to be a list of measures that could be applied to mitigate risks that was included in the interpretive note to the standard. That has since been moved to a best practice paper. The reason for that is that many countries were treating that list of examples more as a should do than a could do. So by moving it from the standard itself into the best practice paper, it's intended to help reframe what exactly those measures should be and to encourage the adoption of a risk-based approach. And then lastly, there was a couple of important clarifications in language. These standards are not, not necessarily changes, but things that FATF put forward to be really clear about some of the areas where we had seen common misconceptions. The first is that nonprofit organizations are not reporting entities or accountable persons. This was made very explicit in the new standard to indicate that they don't operate in the same way as other entities. They don't have clients, they have beneficiaries, and that distinction is different. Secondly, uh, it was very clear in the revised standard that existing measures applied by states to mitigate risk may already be sufficient to protect NPOs. This reflects a sense that in order to be compliant, states had to take action. 
And that wasn't always the case. It's quite possible that the measures that were in place were already sufficient. Thirdly, FATF clarified that for low risk NPOs, outreach alone is sufficient. Additional measures do not necessarily need to be taken and outreach and engagement can be sufficient to mitigating risk. And then lastly, that self-regulatory bodies and measures undertaken by civil society themselves can also constitute a sufficient compliant regime. So I know there's quite a lot of different changes, but I wanted to start by kind of indicating where we have been and talk about where we're going. And now I think we'll move into our regional snapshots um, so we can take a closer look at how these measures look um, within particular parts of the world. So if I may turn first to our colleague, Gina Wood, she is with the Intergovernmental Authority Action Group Against Money Laundering in West Africa. So Gina, uh, that's acronym there is GIABA. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Tracy. I, I sent you my presentation. I don't know if you received it. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Uh, let's see if we can pull that up for you. Okay. Thank you. Yep, there we go. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Tracy, I had to do this in a rush. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try and then uh, work within the five minutes. I was expecting to be the third person also. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Um, I have, um, thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. That sort of makes my work easy here. Um, you mentioned the level of implementation for recommendation eight. As you can see, um, Jaba has a low level of um, compliance rate. We have only one country rated compliant, and that was um, even in, during um, follow up. Um, we will go to we, we can, can we move to the next slide? So this presentation is basically to uh, give you the um the the snapshot or the spotlight of what is happening in our region. I don't intend to go through the whole presentation. I have only five minutes. So I will skip the introduction. I have also mentioned um, the issue of our level of compliance with recommendation eight and also immediate outcome 10. As you can see, we did um, quite badly with immediate outcome 10. Every country, um, this is based on the published virtual evaluation report. So far, out of the 17 um, Jabba count, 50, out of the 15 Jabba countries that have been evaluated, we have 17 member states. Um, all the 15 member states have been rated um, as um, having a low, low effectiveness of an uh, immediate outcome 10. And as you can see, we have one compliant. There's no country um, rated largely compliant and so on. Next slide, please. Um, for the main challenges, um, you have, as you have mentioned earlier, we have similar challenges, but um, from our part, we also um, highlight our overarching challenge to be the lack of understanding of the FATF requirements uh, related to MPOs, which we also amplified in your presentation. And based on the lack of understanding, even for, um, um, those the practitioners and also who are supposed to um, be monitored, it becomes um, quite difficult to engage um, not-for-profit organizations in the region. Um, for um, you can see that most of them, uh, most countries do not even have policies. They don't have strategies on um, engagement with MPOs, um, even for their practices, their normal practices, and then. Um, Engaging them on AML CFT has also been quite difficult due to um, the lack of um, uh, consolidation of efforts, the lack of um, having an overarching um, group that can be uh, contacted to mobilize them for the necessary engagement. So um, next slide, please. 
So um, for the main challenges, we have also highlighted them. The, the major one has been the designation of MPOs as um, reporting entities and also applying the full spectrum of AML CFT requirements to them. Over the years, this is changing and um, we have countries adopting laws and other measures to ensure that MPOs are not subjected to the full range of AML CFT requirements. Based on the lack of understanding, well, there's also the lack of identification of um, MPOs that fall within the FATF definition and also the lack of um, risk assessment. Um, this has basically been um, as a result of the kind of um, working tool that the countries have used in assessing and um, that is conducting the national risk assessment. Nevertheless, we continue impressing on them that the the tool for the national risk assessment is not the decider of what is to be done. They will have to focus on what the FATA standards requires them to do. So if the tool does not provide for a variable for um, assessing the terrorism financing risk of um, MPOs, they will have to generate that to ensure that they meet the FATA standards. So based on the... Um, lack of identification and the rest that have been limited engagement or targeted actions to mitigate any um, risk identified in line with the FATF standards. There have been um, no outreach, there have been no or limited outreach. There have been also um, no or um, limited review or update of the MPO sector to ensure that the um, those identified continue to be um, at risk or whether the uh, risk is being is reducing and also whether new sectors have also um, attained higher have become higher risk to um, TF abuse. Um, next slide, please. So, um, like I said, our uh, challenges are not different. <laughs> we also have the um, the limited uh, monitoring of MPOs and all that. So we can move to the next slide. Um, for us, um, we say that um, uh, if we have a weak foundation, and that is what we have seen, the weak foundation is what is actually um, working against the effective implementation of the standards. So, um, um, as mentioned in the introduction, which I did not um, read, our policies and activities are based on our findings um, in our mutual evaluations and also um, our typologies report and our international engagement in the um, countering the financing of terrorism sphere. So we can move to the next slide. Um, our policies are mainly um, our statutes and what um, ECOWAS um, has uh, determined as a strategic direction and also the FATF standards. So um, next slide. The main statute, that is the JABA statute, and which also talks about our creation, um, shows the regional effort or the regional, um, the regional policy to um, ensure that um, terrorism and its financing do not thrive. And specifically in this way, we'll talk about um, our focus on the MPO sector as required by the FATF standards because JABA is supposed to um, implement the FATF standards in accordance with the FATF standards, including any changes that are made to the FATF standards over a period of time. So next slide, um, we'll go to the next two slides. We can move to the next one. Um, in addition to the Jabba, in addition to the Jabba um, statute, we also have actions or we also have policies or strategies adopted by ECOWAS. Um, we have the counter-terrorism strategy. We also have the regional policy and implementation plan for the counter-terrorism strategy. 
And these um, strategies um, allocate responsibilities to Jaba and member states to fight against terrorism and its financing. I've indicated the areas of interventions that um, Jaba is supposed to um, take in collaboration with its international and technical partners. And this includes um, implementation of the FATA standards, assisting member states to um, conduct risk assessments, um, adopting the necessary measures to implement the interna relevant international conventions, that is the UN Convention against um, UN Convention for the Suppression of and uh, the Financing of Terrorism, the relevant UN resolutions, and all that. Um, we also have, um, if you can move um, to the next, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going through them. Next slide, please. Next slide, I've, I've discussed, mentioned what we have under the ECOWAS Counterterrorism and Implementation Plan. We also have the ECOWAS Vision 2050, which decries the, in the state of terrorism and its financing in the region as being impediments to the consolidation of democratic principles and security in the region. Um, the Vision 2050 also envisages um, taking decisive action to fight against terrorism and aid financing. And this also um, requires JABA and member states and all ECOWAS institutions to take set, certain actions to ensure that um, the, region is, um, the, the region is protected against um, terrorists and their activities. So next slide, please, I think of. Yes, I've mentioned ECOWAS Vision 2050. We also have the areas of intervention there. So Tracy, we can go to the next slide. I think you can, yeah. So for our practices, as I've mentioned, our practices are also based on our, um, our findings in the mutual evaluation reports and all that, and also the recommendations made in those reports. So based on, on this, we also um, assist member countries to improve their laws. We provide um, awareness raising and sensitization programs to um, educate them on the um, terrorism financing risk and how to protect themselves against these um, scourges. We um, organize this in the form of um, regional trainings, national trainings, we also have um, training for judges, training for law enforcement um, agencies, training for MPOs, religious leaders, investigators, and all that. Um, we also um, work with our financial and technical, um, sorry, we also provide financial and technical support to our member states to improve their AML CFT systems, including. Um, conducting national risk assessments, um, enhancing the performance of uh, financial intelligence units, um, also adopting strategies, adopt, um, improving um, their um, compliance, that is training of um, financial institutions and non-designated non-financial businesses and professions to effectively implement the, FATA, the relevant FATF standards. Um, we also engage with our technical and financial partners to um, identify priority areas for intervention. We share information and also um, assist our member states um, identify areas where um, there's the possibility for bilateral relationship with the technical partners and our member states to also um, implement programs according to their areas of intervention. Um, next slide, please. So um, in conclusion, um, we are aware um, that um, ter terrorism has a, is a serious challenge to the region. 
and that they are, have the ways of um, financing it are quite diverse. They keep changing. While we have adopted measures for um, terrorism and its financing, the, we still have issues addressing them. So um, we envisage that what is required is a coordinated action and the pooling of resources for all our member states working with our technical and international technical and financial partners to um, fully address the effects of the, uh, terrorism in the region and also globally. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you, Gina, for giving us such a, a unique look at, at how Giaba operates and what its spaces look like around protecting nonprofit organizations in West Africa. Uh, I'll turn now to our colleague, May Alamant, who will share with a little bit about her experience working on these issues in the Middle East. May, over to you. I think you're muted. Okay. So uh, thank you, Tracy, and uh, good evening, good morning to everyone who is here on, the, on this webinar. So my focus today will be mainly on actually explaining, uh, you know, what are still remaining the challenges within this arena and within the, you know, the, the, the sector of uh, um, nonprofit organizations uh, regarding the um, um, terrorist financing and money laundering. So basically the first, I think, uh, dilemma after working on this topic for the past maybe 10 years at least is still we have a lack of awareness by civil society organization on the topic itself. Um, Sometimes they face restriction, they face issues, but they don't know where is this coming from. And, uh, you know, being well uh, disinformed, sorry, is making you vulnerable to any restrictions or any abuse uh, even from uh, tourist groups. They are not aware of topics of due diligence or topics of uh, beneficial ownership or risk-based approach, for example. And th at the same time, we have an issue with the government also capacity and understanding of the fair requirement of FATF and I'm very happy that you listed at the beginning the new changes and you know explanation of the wording uh, of the FATF uh, documents because uh, still, for example, a lot of uh, um, government um, you know uh, influence the reporting uh, compliance over NGOs and NPOs, um, and still, for example, they are they are not really uh, understanding that uh, FATF is coming to protect the NPOs from being abused, not to restrict the NPOs to be in the safe side. So this is also a second issue. And of course, um, um, you know, there is a huge limited outreach uh, to civil society um, uh, to raise the awareness. And what I'm noticing also is also on the donor side, there is uh, a less, um, let's say, interest in this topic. And this you can, you know, map it through uh, the opportunities of funding within the countries. Um, there is also another issue with the government prioritization. Government receive recommendation eight as one over 40 recommendations, which make, you know, their focus, their intention, their, their uh, work and efforts is actually on the 39, remaining 39 uh, recommendations, uh, which also give less attention to, to this topic. Um, when um, is intentionally, uh, purposely used, FATF rest, uh, can restrict legitimate activities of NPOs, as you mentioned, and this is hugely practiced, and we can see it from, you know, the legal framework and the uh, um, increased, actually, uh, oversight and monitoring and uh, for the foreign fundings in the in the MENA countries. And this is um, a common issue that is faced by the different uh, CSOs. Um, there is another also thing that I noticed, which is lack of coalition and networking between the organization in the MENA region, working and defending um, you know, their position against the restriction uh, influenced by the FATF procedures. And yes, we have some activities from time to time where we have conferences and you know, meeting, but still, unfortunately, there is no um, actual 
um, let's say, platform for uh, or community of practice for sharing experiences or um, sharing solutions of what going, uh, what what we should do. Finally, I have um, two very quick points. First of all, uh, I want to highlight the issue of sustainability of co collaboration or best practices because, for example, in Jordan or Tunisia, we had a, a very good practice of partnership between civil society organization and government when it comes to uh, doing the risk assessment, the NPO's risk assessment, very participatory, um, you know, very good results uh, approved by both parties. However, the question remain, is this sustainable? Do we continue the dialogue in terms of the actions that or recommendation that we should take and, and have a one, um, you know, have a common, uh, sorry, decision making process in terms of um, either change in legislation or anything or not? Because in many countries, this is not the case and it ends until the first collaboration operation that has ended. The second thing I want to highlight uh, and last thing actually is that um, within uh, the MENA region, uh, it's in the middle of conflict. Um, and, you know, the recent uh, Gaza um, issue is also, um, you know, one of the things that is happening all the time. Um, and this require more humanitarian actions, which means that also we need to really find uh, solutions and talk more and discuss more how is um, the need for this humanitarian action will not be hindered by the you know um, the restrictive actions by governments and by the whole system, but also how is this a humanitarian um, um, you know assistance that's not going to be abused by uh, terrorist uh, uh, financing or terrorist groups. So this also um, keep us all the time alarmed and and uh, um, encourage us to keep the discussion on this topic. This is in general, but thank you, Tracy, for this opportunity. And if there were any, if there are any questions uh, at the last uh, session, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, May, for highlighting some really interesting reflections on what it means to be a part of this process and, and where you start to see successes and, and breakdowns. I'll turn now to Miguel de la Vega, who will share his experience working in Latin America and with Gafila. Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you very much for the Global Center for the invitation. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I just um, like to highlight a couple, some, some issues that we're facing in the region. Uh, taking into what Gina said uh, regarding Africa, she mentioned that terrorism is um, one of the major concerns in Africa. In the case of Latin America, is is exactly the opposite. It's it's not it's not one of the major concerns in the region. Nevertheless, we are uh, most organizations are suffering uh, some of the effects of the uh, regulation related to counterterrorism. Some of the most common cases that we are facing uh, related. To CT restrictions or CFT restrictions. First of all, is the universal regulation. We have a, a, several countries, most of them, that apply regulation which is not based on a risk approach as uh, FATF recommends, which means that uh, they are regulated in the same way or very similar way as some other sectors, uh, in especially the nonprofit the non-profit um, type of uh, activities. The lack of a uh, sector risk assessment in most countries also favors this, making the regulation of organization more a matter of uh, perception of authorities than based in reality on what their actual risks are related to their activities, their, their, their legal composition, their location, etc. This situation is starting to change uh, slowly, but it's starting to change. There are some countries now that have conducted uh, risk assessments, national risk assessments, and in very few cases, uh, sector risk assessments. One of the countries that we have light as, as a good practice is, is Peru. Peru uh, commissioned a sector risk, a specific risk assessment to a group of consultants and a foreign uh, NGO to uh, propose a methodology for risk assessment. They conducted that and they proved through the sector risk assessment that most organizations are low risk, 
and uh, there is just a very small uh, number of organizations that need a specific monitoring, but not, uh, of course, in line with FATF, not uh, all the sector needed to be uh, regulated in that way or of light entities. Nevertheless, still in the country, they continue to be considered of light entities. This, uh, this situation generates a, an, an overburden of obligations because uh, all organizations are subject to their respective laws and obligation, which in turn generates uh, additional expenses for organizations. The need to, in some cases, hire a specific personnel to comply with, with the, the regulations. And also, it's it's a matter of time consumption for organizations. Resources, valuable resources, time and money that should be devoted to beneficiaries instead of fulfilling obligations that are not needed in, in most cases. An indirect effect is financial exclusion. Um, in most countries, we have uh, witnessed that uh, CSOs have a very difficult time accessing uh, banking services. Um, mostly because of the uh, erroneous perception that most organizations are at risk. But in certain cases, there are government, uh, government uh, dispositions that uh, create additional requirements for banks in order to conduct due diligence to uh, civil society organizations. This creates, in turn, financial exclusion, which puts organizations under pressure to um, because some of them have have their accounts canceled, or they have their, or they are not able to open accounts, or certain um, transactions have been rejected, just because the uh, civil society organization doesn't behave in the same way financially as a for-profit organization. They have their own nature and characteristics. In the most worrying cases or pressing cases that we see in the region is the use of CT and CFT measures um, intentionally used to uh, criminalize, to stigmatize, and in, and in in extreme cases, to dissolve organizations. These have been the cases of Nicaragua and Venezuela, which have been, and is still very, very worrying, because it's, uh, the, the, the regulation has become a tool for those regimes in order to practically destroy civil society or, or limit the activities that they, the legitimate, uh, legitimate activities. It's especially notorious in the case of human rights organizations that have been accused of promoting or protecting or even financing terrorism activities. Uh, that's like the extreme case we have seen, but it represents a trend that's wor that should be worried uh, that should be of concern, not only for our region, but for other regions as well. Now, um, this is like the situation at this moment. Nevertheless, we, as we, as I mentioned, we see certain changes, certain positive changes. One is the one I mentioned for Peru. But uh, last week in Argentina, uh, the, the Congress in Argentina had a major advance because they uh, agreed to change their legislation in order to not consider all uh, non-profit organizations as obliged entities for CT regulation. This is a major step in the country because it's the first one that has stated uh, this measure and that has undergone this deep change, this, this change and considering that this is one of the major countries and the major economies in the, in the region, it should set an example for others to follow in order to demonstrate that the universal approach and, uh, the, 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 and, and, and declaring that all organizations are of like entities is not in line with FATF requirements and doesn't contribute to their protection and their legitimate activities. There are certain challenges that still uh, exist in the region. For example, we need to um, insist on establishing dialogue spaces in between governments, organizations, but also the financial sector. This is especially relevant when we want to insist on the need for financial inclusion. 
an aspect that has been highlighted in several of the mutual evaluations uh, around the region. Then it's also the upcoming um, fifth round of mutual evaluations, which are going to be conducted under the updated version of the interpretative note of recommendation eight, and also the best practices paper that has already been mentioned uh, by Tracy and highlighted on, on some of the, the, the main aspects of interest for civil society. This is a challenge because the fact that the documents have been updated doesn't mean that the mutual evaluation is going to be conducted in the best possible way under those standards. It depends very much on the training of, of the evaluators uh, that are going to participate in the mutual evaluation, that these uh, processes actually reflect the reality and reflect the intention of the countries to really adapt their norms and regulation to these uh, updated standards. And also, it's a matter of, uh, it's also a challenge for civil society in order to participate and advocate for changes that are aligned with the updated standards. Um, there's a specific uh, challenges as well in, in, in devaluation in these countries, says, in, in these countries that have already uh, been evaluated, uh, Venezuela and uh, Nicaragua, because not only they are the most pressing cases, but also because they have very um, different evaluations, different results in the evaluation. Um, Venezuela was evaluated uh, under GAFIC, the Caribbean FATF, regional style, uh, style body, and their grades were really low, reflecting the use of these measures against civil society. While in the case of Nicaragua, it was not, their, their evaluation on recommendation eight was not reflecting the amount of damage that is being done. Uh, and this has uh, been of concern to FATF itself, which has uh, developed certain uh, provisions in order to follow up on these on these situations. Finally, I would like to say that um, taking into account the chart that Tracy showed at the beginning, you could see that probably Latin America is not one of the most one of the cases in which countries are labeled as not non-compliant. It's just some countries that are in in, in that fall into the, that uh, category. Nevertheless, most countries are labeled as partially compliant. This uh, represents um, that uh, we still have major challenges in, in, in the region, and also that uh, organizations are still suffering from uh, severe restrictions related to CT measures and CFT measures, even considering the fact that we don't have um, uh, terrorist activities in uh, in the region, or there, in 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 the worst case scenario, the, the, there are pockets of remaining activities in certain countries that could be uh, considered terrorism, but is more deception than the rule. This means that civil society needs to be supported into training, into participating, into strengthening the advocacy capacities. This also means that. The financial sector should be included in these in these dialogues and this and this experience in order to um, include civil society, which means that organizations are going to be better prote protected if they are uh, operating through regulated channels. And finally, there is uh, strong challenges for governments in order to adapt existing regulations that were put in place before any uh, any any risk assessment. And now they have the challenge uh, to not only comply with this, but also to better protect civil society while enabling activities if they want to support, uh, if they want to support uh, a, 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 a democratic framework in which these organizations operate. Unfortunately, one of the trends that we also see is the rise of authoritarian governments or at least populist governments which are not much in favor of protecting or enabling civil society. So therefore, it's a matter of also international solidarity to support the efforts of organizations that are dealing and advocating for better con conditions in which they 
are continued to be protected against terrorist financing, but also enabled for this legitimate MPO. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, as I look forward for questions. Thank you, Miguel, and, and particularly many things that you highlighted, but especially the gap between evaluation cycles um, and on the daylight that can be between evaluation findings and the experience on the ground, indicating that, you know, it's not just non-compliant countries that have significant challenges and barriers. There's quite a few that exist in that partially compliant space where um, it can often be even more difficult to find where the rubber meets the road on these, these issues. Uh, I will turn next to our colleague, Maluka Nyoga Dubale, who is from the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group. Maluka, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting Islam Lak to be part of this important event. Uh, can Am I audible, Tracy? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I'm going to briefly highlight the issue of uh, the implementation of effective recommendation 8 in uh, the Islam lag region uh, within a very uh, short time. Uh, for those of you who may not know about Islam lag, uh, we are one of uh, the uh, FATF style regional bodies like Java, Mena Fatah, and uh, Gafila colleagues. Uh, we have currently uh, 25 members. Uh, DRC is the regional observer of Islam lag. The one that we see on the map highlighted in green color is uh, are our members. Islam lag, uh, like any other FSRB or FATF, uh, we exercise uh, four core mandates, one of uh, which is um, in terms of assessing our member jurisdictions, in terms of the FATF standards. And for this topic, I think I just would like to mention the issue on the implementation to do with uh, recommendation eight and other recommendations, uh, which are uh, pertinent for any pure sector. Uh, generally, uh, these are the fundamental recommendations that we normally use when we see, when we uh, assess our member jurisdictions on uh, NPO issues. And based on this uh, standard, this, uh, we have come up with a policy, uh, as you could see from the screen, uh, and this is also our principle that we are normally following. Uh, we encourage our member jurisdiction uh, based on the fact that recommendation eight does not apply to NPO sector as a whole. They must concentrate on subset of NPOs which fall within a better definition in the high risk or are likely having high risk for terrorism financing. The role of uh, donors besides the NPOs should also be considered and uh, there must be a proper outreach program that they must do, our member jurisdictions, I mean. And countries should also take a targeted approach, and the one size fits all does not uh, is not appropriate. On this regard, we give emphasis on uh, the issue of over regulation, including on uh, listing or designating NPOs as one of the reporting institutions, as alluded by my uh, other colleagues who made the presentation on a similar topic. And the last issue is. Uh, Attached with the fourth one, of course, I already mentioned about no overregulation. Uh, so far, we have assessed uh, 14 member, uh, sorry, 17 member jurisdictions in the current round. I think the list of countries they are already uh, shown on the screen. Since I'm going to share this uh, slide, and maybe Tracy, you can share with the participants so that I save time. But there are 17 countries we have which we, we have so far assessed based on the current uh, FATF standard. And this is the methodology that we normally use. We look at the risk and context of our jurisdictions. When, when we are rating uh, doing the necessary analysis on technical compliance and effectiveness, we take into account risk and context, and then we come up with key findings and recommended actions. Normally, one of the emphasis that we provide for countries to address as a key recommended action is to apply a risk-based approach on the oversight and monitoring of uh, 
the non-profit organizations for counter-terrorism financing purposes, and at the same time, uh, uh, to um, not to target all uh, NGOs which are also having uh, uh, low risk for terrorism finance. So this is a level of compliance um, among our member jurisdictions, as you could see, uh, both from um, effectiveness and the technical compliance point of view, our member jurisdictions they are still rated with uh, partially compliant and non-compliant on the implementation of uh, recommendation 80 and other uh, relevant recommendations. So our member jurisdictions are uh, facing so many things. And uh, generally, I would like to uh, give you um, a fact that uh, I would like to raise the fact that only two member jurisdictions are uh, having a largely compliant rating so far on recommendation eight. Je based on our assessment, we have observed that there are some legal uh, challenges, operational challenges, even in, from a political or political commitment point of view, we have seen uh, so many challenges. So uh, I would like to give uh, an emphasis on this one based on the time available. The first, the uh, implementation issue that we have observed in our member jurisdiction is in terms of identification of uh, NPOs, which were uh, within the, the definition of FATF. As we may know, there is a footnote under uh, criterion 8.1 of FATF recommendation 8. So most countries, they have not yet identified the subset of NPOs which uh, fall within that definition. Uh, we have also observed that the policies, uh, law, legal framework is in place. In many jurisdictions, they are outdated and they are not making a focus on safety issues. Uh, um, the policy are not uh, risk, risk informed policies. So these are really creating uh, some issues. So the policy uh, we're supposed to make a focus on safety elements, especially for the purpose of this exercise and countries we are supposed to encourage transparency and accountability uh, among the NPOs to be uh, properly regulated. We have also observed that countries are having a challenge in identifying the type of NPOs which are likely to have a risk uh, for terrorism financing purposes. And sometimes they might have done a risk assessment, but that a risk assessment either it was not involving uh, the civic space it was not comprehensive. Source of information uh, was not that much uh, full fledged, and uh, there is also data scarcity, scarcity and uh, inconsistency uh, while they were carrying out or uh, undertaking a risk assessment on the sectoral um, NPO risk assessment. And we have also observed that the some, uh, for example, intelligence community, uh, they may not be willing to share information because of confidentiality issues why uh, the relevant authorities are undertaking risk assessment on uh, the NPO sector for terrorism finances. But, uh, there is also an issue on outreach activity. Uh, we have observed that there are more than one regulatory authorities uh, which are uh, normally observed. And, and because of this, they don't know even uh, how to come up with a comprehensive uh, outreach activity plan uh, to make sure that uh, they are uh, sensitizing or uh, creating a, a good level of awareness on uh, understanding the issue of TF among uh, the civic space, especially the NPO sectors which fall within the subset of FETF definition. We have also observed that uh, the risk assessment that they are normally doing is focusing on money laundering and terrorism financing. And because of this, uh, there is an uh, attitude of uh, listing or designating NEPOs as one of the reporting institutions uh, for them to implement MSFT related obligations like banks and so on, and this becomes an issue. And whenever uh, we are asking uh, banks and other institutions, for example, the way how they are treating the NPO sector as uh, their customers, they normally tell us that they all of the NPO sectors, they are high risk customers for them because they are not being informed by the risk uh, result as the risk assessment result being uh, done by the different jurisdictions. Uh, we have also observed that there is a challenge on effectiveness information gathering and uh, investigation. On that aspect, uh, first, the private sector, the role of the private sector, including on NPOs, uh, is not being uh, considered. 
Uh, and also among the different competent authorities, there is no such effective coordination to make sure that they are targeting NPOs involving in uh, TF or TF related criminal activities. And uh, there is no also uh, disruptive measure being taken by targeting NPOs uh, which are uh, involving in criminal activities. We have also observed that whenever jurisdictions are requesting information uh, in terms of facilitating international cooperation, either in a form of formal or informal with printings, there is always uh, absence of contact in most of uh, our jurisdictions. So, Based on these challenges, uh, ESAM Lab uh, uh, is recognizing global efforts in enhancing the implementation of the global standards on safety issues, including on the issue of preventing the misuse of NPOs for terrorism financing. Uh, we are currently assisting our members through assessments, monitoring their progress through follow-up processes, uh, technical assistance, training provision, including on their risk assessment. We are also having different uh, platforms like a five forum, RKMG, whereby they are discussing on the issue of the regulation of NPOs. Uh, normally, uh, we also of the uh, developed uh, regional CFT operational that also covers the issue on how to regulate NPOs or oversight NPOs by applying a risk-based approach. Uh, the current one is uh, being developed as uh, a third phase of uh, this project. And we are also undertaking uh, uh, a risk assessment, a regional TF risk assessment, including on the issue of NPOs. I'm sure once this uh, project is finalized, we will find a way of publishing a sanitized version of uh, that report for the world to know in the situation of uh, TF, especially on uh, NPO in the world, uh, in our region. Uh, currently, we have also signed uh, uh, organizations like the Global Center for Corporate Security, uh, you know, MOU and one of the activities that we are going to undertake based on the requirement of the MOU is by conducting a horizontal review on the implementation of Recommendation 8 by uh, our member jurisdictions. And uh, we are hopeful that this will uh, enable uh, us to appreciate uh, the contextual information, background information on the issue of Recommendation 8 in the context of our region. The ESAMLAC safety operational plan is uh, aimed to achieve understanding on TF risk, including on the TF risk uh, issue on NPO, uh, to do a legal reforms, including a periodical review of the legal uh, framework, the initial frameworks, especially uh, in relation to the regulation and oversight of NPO. And also, we are intending to uh, organize different workshops, webinars to enhance uh, interagency cooperation as well as the cooperation between uh, public and uh, private institutions. So uh, in conclusion, I think um, we still believe that the NPOs and uh, the different uh, regulatory authorities, they must work together. Uh, the NPOs, the regulatory authorities, they must also be the supervisory authorities of different sectors so that they will have uh, a good sensitization on um, understanding or appreciating the TF risk behind the NPO and not NPO to be considered as high uh, risk uh, customers uh, for the reporting in institutions. Um, if just in case NPOs also uh, are discovering any criminal element, I think they must work hand in hand with the government and institutions so that uh, the government side we get the proper information action on the, regu of, uh, the regulation of NPOs. Uh, uh, and maybe in terms of appreciating the risk, uh, we should also explore the possibility of developing our toolkit for undertaking a risk assessment on TF uh, for uh, the NPO sector. Uh, so this is my submission within uh, maybe a short time. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any question, I am ready to answer. Thank you, Malukin, for highlighting what the compliance landscape looks like in your region. Um, I will take just a few minutes here at the end to speak to a partnership that the Global Center had with another of the FATF style regional bodies, the Asia Pacific Group on Money Laundering, to share some of the findings of a research we did into the uh, compliance landscape on Recommendation 8. So in undertaking this, we really had two central questions. First, we wanted to understand what are the specific parts of Recommendation 8 that the APG members were struggling with, 
as you've heard, there's quite a lot that goes into this recommendation. Um, and like Miguel is experienced in Latin America, in the Asia Pacific region, the majority of members were in that partially or largely compliant space. And then secondly, we wanted to take a step back and see how the evaluators themselves were reviewing compliance. How consistent were the mutual evaluation reports? What types of information were being included? And importantly, what was not included? The end result of this report um, included a heat map, which is a color-coded visualization of the strengths and weaknesses across the region aligned with FATF's mutual evaluation methodology for recommendation eight. I'll give just a couple of highlights from our key findings in this discussion, although the report is publicly available if anyone's interested in delving further. Um, in terms of areas of strength, we found that international cooperation and information gathering tended to be places where the procedures and frameworks were in place, but we found very little information in the mutual evaluation reports um, that indicated that there had been a need to use those mechanisms with respect to NPOs. More often than not, it was simply that these frameworks existed for other types of terrorism financing investigations and information sharing and simply had been expanded to permit um, their usage in relation to NPOs. In this kind of mixed category, so we had um, places where there was even either uneven progress, information gaps, or where we found some discrepancies in the data. And the first kind of mixed element was related to risk assessment. And there were several contributing factors here. First, only about 60% of the evaluated APG members had identified the subset of NPOs that meet the FATAF definition which meant that they were not targeting the right audience. That's a challenge that Malukin just highlighted in the Samag region as well. We also found room for improvement in meaningfully involving NPOs in the risk assessment process. More often than not, they were kind of consulted rather than involved as meaningful partners in the process, which means that you're not getting a full picture of the information as well as not really bringing uh, all stakeholders on board to act, take actions after that risk assessment. But the biggest weak point we found was that countries were struggling to review the adequacy of existing risk mitigation measures. Only half of APG members had done that, which means that we weren't taking stock of whether or not the efforts that were in place were meaningfully responding to the risk. There is an opportunity here, though. The majority of APG members had a policy in place to update their risk assessments periodically. And so what that means is that many of them are going to start this process again in the coming couple of years. So there's an opportunity to address those gaps, to foster more inclusive partnerships, to create a more robust evidence base, um, something that would really improve the quality of the risk assessment, which in turn underpins many other facets of compliance with Recommendation 8. The second kind of mixed criteria space was related to the adoption of risk-based measures to mitigate risk uh, and to create oversight and monitoring mechanisms. Here we found that there was a variety of measures that were reportedly being applied, but very little information to suggest that they were risk-based. In our consultations for this report with nonprofit organizations in the region, many raised notable concerns that these uh, measures were overly intrusive and arduous. And there were even references in some of the mutual evaluation reports to those concerns specifically. We also found a lot of duplication across these criteria throughout the reports. So taken together, what we saw was that there was an inadvertent kind of skewing of perceptions about what it meant to be compliant. Seeing information replicated across a number of criteria was creating this emphasis that in order to be compliant, you needed to demonstrate that you had taken on more supervisory and regulatory measures, that there was a need to kind of show that there was actions taken, which ultimately was contributing to more of a one size fits all approach where examples that were provided in the FATF guidance were kind of just being universally applied um, because that's what the countries thought evaluators would be looking for. And then the weakest spot in our research was related to outreach and engagement. And I think that's something that's been touched on by all of our other panelists today. Um, but within the APG region, our research found that it was really occurring to some degree, but more often ad hoc and uneven. Practically, 
outreach was being treated as synonymous as trainings. It means it was a one-way sharing of information from government to civil society, rather than focused on fostering a meaningful dialogue or collaboration to promote more comprehensive risk mitigations. That would be one of the primary takeaways from this research is that outreach and engagement is an often overlooked but critical aspect of compliance. Put simply, governments cannot do this alone, and civil society has an important role to play in making sure that measures are adequately risk-based, that they remain proportionate, and to advising as to when they begin to disrupt and discourage legitimate NPO activities. And that's what brings me to my final point here on effectiveness. Within the FATF evaluation criteria, there is consideration as to whether measures are disrupting or discouraging legitimate NPO activity. In our research, we found notably little information on this point in the evaluation reports. Just 25% of the reports either directly or indirectly considered this component, which made it difficult to understand whether it was given any weight into the mutual evaluation ratings. Now that that language on disrupting or discouraging is part of the core standard and not just part of the evaluation methodology, we have a new opportunity to review our attention as to how exactly we can measure when measures become stepping into that arduous and, and overly burdensome space. And I think this is an area that you'll see significant attention moving into the next round of mutual evaluations. So I will leave it there for now, um, but certainly welcome further discussion. But before we do so, I'm going to turn it over to our colleague, Sankita Goswami, who's going to take a look at the more forward-looking piece of this process. We've, we've spent a lot of time on where we are, um, but she's been asking some really important questions on where we should be going. So I will turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tracy, and hello, everyone. Yeah, and as Tracy was saying, we've been sort of in the weeds on this for this call, but I'll try and zoom out a little bit and uh, try and put forth some of um, the larger questions that we looked at in our piece of research, which is um, uh, titled The Future of Recommendation 8, a foresight piece. Now, as you know, as a coalition of nonprofits, we've been working for more than a decade now to mitigate some of the unintended and intended consequences of the implementation of Rec8 on civil society. And we've always wondered through this process what it would be like if we just got rid of the recommendation altogether. Um, so we decided to do a piece of research interrogating just this question. So what does the future of the counterterrorism financing framework as it applies to NPOs look like? And at the heart of this is the exceptionalism really that has been meted out to the nonprofit sector under this framework. Uh, as you know, NPOs are actually the only legal entity to merit an entire recommendation of their own. Uh, and this unusual attention to nonprofits since 2001 has led to the overregulation and suppression of the sector, as well as the challenges uh, in accessing financing that you've heard from Miguel and others. Now, the problem facing nonprofit organizations caught in this web of sort of legislative, regulatory, and policy strictures is, as we identified in the research, threefold. So the first is the framework of the FATF itself and the nonprofit standard within it. So that's recommendation eight. Uh, the second tier is the implementation of the standard at the national level. And finally is the market. So the market which reads the signals generated at the normative level um, and the national level and applies, it, applies these rules and regulations uh, into regulating financial access and transfers for nonprofits, and this being the very lifeblood of nonprofit operations, uh, the transfers. Um, in our research, we apply a dual lens. So one, an evolutionary lens, and the other, a revolutionary lens to each of these three layers to help analyze potential solutions for each that might better serve uh, civil society going forward. Um, so in terms of the first tier, so the norms uh, set forth by the FATF framework, the radical call always has been to get rid of the recommendation entirely, with the argument that not every risk of terrorism financing merits its own recommendation. Uh, you would, of course, still assess the sector under 
potentially recommendation one, which focuses on the entirety of financial integrity risk, po risk posed to society and any residual risk that you find um, uh, pertaining to the sector uh, could then be dealt with under recommendations 24, 25, for example, with beneficial, style, uh, beneficial ownership style regulations. Uh, and of course, in terms of the evolutionary approach, we've been seeing that as has been pointed out by um, Tracy and others, um, uh, you know, the FATF has instituted this unintended consequences work stream um, in 2021 um, due partly to a lot of the pressure that the coalition put on, put on them and the evidence uh, that we presented or have been presenting over the years, uh, which has led to sort of the recent changes to the recommendation and a revised guidance paper on its implementation, as you've been hearing. And while very welcome, uh, this will not solve the problem of the intentional misuse of the standard, uh, which we are seeing more and more, especially as Miguel was highlighting in, in in authoritarian contexts. Um, so the coalition has actually called for fundamental changes to the assessment methodology so that disproportionate regulation of the sector can be called out. As Tracy was saying, that's still a bit of a hit and miss in terms of, uh, you know, when you do the horizontal reviews, you can see that. Um, and um, assessors, as, as a colleague said as well, need to be trained appropriately so that they are sensitized to these uh, uh, consequences. But they also need to be made aware, the assessors that is, of other equally legitimate policy priorities that governments have, such as upholding international humanitarian law, uh, international human rights law, and the obligations of countries related to freedoms of expression, association, assembly, so that intentional misuse and routine derogation of these rights can be called out in the assessment. And this currently is not happening. And the FATF also currently provides no guidance on how states should implement its standards in compliance with international law, including IHL, uh, humanitarian law and international human rights law, and without undermining uh, fundamental freedoms. Um, in the best case scenario, simple reference to international law in FATF standards without pointing towards specifics is actually meaningless in practice. And at worst, the mere mention can create the illusion that the FATF and the implementing government have actually seriously considered rights as foundational for the policy in question, even though that is often not the case. I know that UNCTED and OHCHR um, have a draft guidance in place on um, implementing CFT measures, taking into account uh, human rights uh, um, obligations of governments. And, you know, we are very much looking forward to that piece of guidance uh, and seeing how that can be implemented going forward. Now, the second tier that uh, research looks at is, of course, the national context. And that's where all these problems come home to roost. So even though, uh, you know, some of the uh, normative standards and some of the language in the normative standards have been tightened, uh, it's still at the implementation phase that much of the problems lie. Um, and the FATF, of course, calls for a risk-based approach, which is necessarily contextual in nature. And this is where an essential sort of implementation dichotomy uh, emerges. So the FATF framework at the end of the day is a set of universal benchmarks that must be adhered to in vastly different settings. Yet the measure of effectiveness within that framework remains predicated on box ticking technical compliance with universal standards and really not on the reality of financial integrity risk in a specific country. And this becomes very apparent when you look at the gray list, for example, uh, which are, you know, uh, non-compliant sort of which uh, jurisdictions uh, subject to increased monitoring. And the list is largely populated by countries of the global south, even though everyone knows that it is, you know, the mainly developed large economies that are enabling and facilitating money laundering, for example. So what then happens is that countries on the gray list tend to go into overdrive trying to plug technical compliance gaps, uh, given the impact that you know, being on the gray list has on a country's economy. And this overcorrection mode is where much of the damage is done to the nonprofit operational en environment as countries uh, scramble to impose restrictive laws and regulations uh, that they hope will return them to FATF compliance. And this brings us to the third issue we tackle in the research, which is the market. 
Uh, now, banks are interested with making key decisions, gauging financial integrity risk. In practice, therefore, what governments do is leave the gatekeeping function to banks, fining them if they slip up. But banks are for-profit entities with their own risk calculus and appetite. And in the absence of adequate risk calibration by the government or the bank regulator, what results is the risk averseness um, that we see today and the wholesale de-risking of whole classes of consumer, such as nonprofits. So um, uh, instead of sort of governments uh, focusing on the uh, or addressing the drivers of financial crime at a societal level and focusing on disruption, prevention, and education. What stands in for all of this is compliance, which is another form of box ticking. So in terms of the market, so the third tier, the revolutionary approach we suggest uh, entails a recalibration of the concept of risk. So there are two prongs to this. One is to construct risk in a manner that is more multidimensional than it is now. So risk today only reflects the potential terrorism financing risk to the state. It does not take into account the multitudes of other risks. Uh, the risk, for example, of an overly securitized approach, including the misuse of these financial integrity frameworks by governments, which hamper legitimate nonprofit activity, whose work actually through humanitarianism or development or human rights or peace building actually contributes to the mitigation of that very terrorism risk. So it is important to ask what risk and whose risk we are considering when we speak about the risk-based approach and what we miss when risk is not thought about holistically. And the other prong, of course, is to interrogate the foundational aspect of how risk is seen today. We seem to have become risk societies where risk is adjudged not based on scientific data or statistical data or the mode of strict probability as an academic has termed it, but on possibility. So on suspicion and preemption and imagination. And this, this needs reining in uh, this possibilistic mode if we are to be effective in fighting financial crime. And in terms of the evolutionary, but this can also be revolutionary actually, there needs to be a rethink on where the risk-based approach sits and whether it is better served by moving it from the regulated, so the banks, to the regulator. So what we need in effect, as one of our interviewees told us, is a rule-based approach for everyone and a risk-based approach for the bigger players. Uh, and our research indicated that the risk-based approach was actually inappropriate for smaller regulated ins institutions, not only for being too resource intensive, but also for the underlying assumption made that industry as a whole, so the market would be better at identifying and managing risk than the regulators or the supervisors. Um, and the Netherlands has recently initiated just such a move uh, at recalibration. So the Dutch Banking Association, supported by the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance, has come up with a sec set of sectoral base, um, baselines for nonprofits organi uh, organizations. So banks are initially meant to see NPOs as neutral. So all NPOs are meant to be seen as neutral. And they would then apply a risk lens to do, as they term it, more if necessary, less if possible in terms of due diligence. So the calibration happens somewhere else, basically. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to skip the next bit because uh, I think I'm running out of time. But we ask in the research, and uh, I'll put the uh, paper in the chat box later on. We ask larger questions about the accountability and transparency of the FATF as a body. We ask questions about the FATF's own funding mechanisms. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, countries use their overseas development assistance budgets to support the FATF, citing, uh, you know, SDG 16 on tackling illicit financial flows. And this is extremely problematic given that the FATF framework is deliberately misused in many countries to undercut those very SDGs. So, you know, we ask these larger questions around uh, sort of, you know, the necessity of instituting accountability and redress mechanisms, even though it's not a treaty body, uh, because, you know, this non-institution creating soft law, you know, having so much power as the FATF, but not adequate checks and balances is very problematic. And I'll just finish by saying that I think there's been a disproportionate focus on nonprofits and terrorism financing in the last two decades or so. Uh, and that has been to the detriment of nonprofit philanthropy, you know, human rights imperatives, as well as financial integrity 
uh, imperative. So we desperately need a course correction, whether that's evolutionary or revolutionary. Uh, and you know, this course correction should ad advance sort of coherent policy goals, um, uh, coherent policy across the goals of financial integrity, financial inclusion, and the efficient and effective delivery by nonprofit organizations of humanitarian assistance, of sustainable development of human rights protection, and of peace building. And I'll leave it there for now and happy to take questions. Thank you, Sankita, and really helpful to do that zoom out and to take the, the big picture questions to say, you know, what would this look like if we could start again? Um, certainly. We do have a few minutes left for questions, so I will open the floor. Um, feel free to use the raise your hand feature, uh, but I'll come first to Garrett Zach from the OSCE. Garrett, the floor is yours. Hi, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm member or I'm a staff member of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, we're um, one of the biggest uh, regional security organizations covering 57 participating states. That's North America, Europe, including the Western Balkans, South Caucasus, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and we also have 11 Asian and Mediterranean partners for cooperation. Um, here at the Action Against Terrorism Unit, we do a lot of work on CFT, um, and that is based on capacity building, capacity development, a lot on PF investigations. But since we've seen all, I mean, we haven't really touched upon the OEC area so much, but a lot of the points that were mentioned today by many of the speakers, we do unfortunately see also as an issue in the OECE. So um, um, in addition to the capacity building that um, on, on investigations and multi-stakeholder approaches, we've um, last year launched and we're grateful for the cooperation also with the Human Security Collective in this regard, um, a new course also on the implementation of um, Recommendation 8. We also see kind of what several um, speakers have mentioned in terms of this need to engage into some sort of a dialogue um, with the private sector. So we're launching a new initiative there um, later this quarter um, to try and also kind of get this conversation between the public sector, the private sector, and also have NPOs there. And we also hope to do more in the future when it comes to both awareness raising, um, but also building on all of this work. So I just wanted to use this opportunity to, first of all, thank you for the organization of this really important event, um, the insightful presentations, and also mention that um, we really re remain to, um, committed to further work on this topic and also hopefully to do it more in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the perspectives from your region and highlighting some of the work that OCE is doing on this. Um, I also will turn next to Anthony Miller. Anthony, the floor is yours. Apologies. Uh, I had some sort of technical issue. So I that did not mean to raise my hand. I will say as a general thank you, this was a very interesting and uh, insightful presentation, series of presentations. No problem. We for certainly understand the challenges of different platforms and statuses. Um, we do have a couple of questions here in the chat, so I will pose those in our few remaining minutes to our panelists. Um, at first, I see there's a question directed to Giaba around what does NPO not amenable for regulation mean? Gina, I think you indicated you'd like to answer, so I'll turn to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Tracy. I seem to be having some glitches here. Um, some MPOs not being amenable to um, regulation. I explained in my presentation that um, some of the MPOs actually refuse to be regulated. They do not um, see the need to be regulated. And so that is what has actually um, caused the delays in coming up with um, regulation. They believe that after they have registered with the relevant ministry, there's no need for any, um, even um, the voluntary 
uh, the associations they have, they consider them as voluntary and that nobody should tell them what to do. But over the years, this seemed to be changing because um, they have found the need to be in cooperation and also have some, some sort of united front to, um, as we say, when they said that, that the space is being crowded, or being crowded out of their space. So some have found a united front to come together to um, confront, um, if I can say, those um, trying to get them to implement the FATF standards. So that's what I meant by some MPOs are not um, amenable to um, being regulated. And um, they are, it's not only MPOs that are, are, have sort of refused to be regulated. We also have... Um, um the um lawyers who are also um sort of do not seem to agree that um they should be asked to implement the relevant um FATF standards. Thank you. I hope um I, um answered your question. Great, thank you, Gina. Uh, we have another question in the chat that shifts focus away from FATF and takes a look at Security Council Resolution 2664, which it created a cross-cutting humanitarian exemption as part of UN sanctions regimes. Uh, and the question was, is there has been any indirect positive effect, for example, in advocacy efforts related to Recommendation 8? Uh, Sangeeta, I'll turn to you for this one. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Alice, for that question. Um, yeah, actually, it's been the opposite because, um, you know, we thought, okay, 2664 and, you know, cross-cutting humanitarian exemption, all very well and good. But when you talk to banks, what they say is, but the counterterrorism um, financing regulations and rules and laws and the material support um, uh, rules and regulations haven't gone away and we still have to abide by those. So then there is this sort of... Um, a policy clash there and you know which one trumps the other one and banks tend to be as i was just saying risk averse um so yeah so then they say yeah but we'll still be liable for material support so you know under under this national regulation whatever so in spite of uh, the overarching sanctions uh, we're not going to make that transfer so that's what we are seeing actually so unless unless there's more coherence at national level unless sort of your sanctions exemptions and your counterterrorism rules and regulations are more aligned i think we're going to keep seeing delays and as maya was saying it's becoming you know apparent now in the case of you know gaza etc um yeah and it's something we are um, sort of uh, seeing um, uh, uh, as well, uh, uh, very, very, very sort of um, often. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, and if I might add to that, I think one of the important pieces to remember in this space is that there is a sunset clause on the 2664 exemption for the UN's counterterrorism sanctions regimes. And so it is set to expire at the beginning of December this year. And in our conversations, um, that it's had an impact and that there's a bit of a reluctance to undertake whole scale transformation of approaches when there isn't certainty that that exemption will continue to exist for the counterterrorism sanctions regime. So that's another additional challenge in this space is, is creating different levels of engagement across different sanctions regimes, but also as Sangeeta mentioned within counterterrorism legislation as well. Uh, I think we have come just to about our time, although I will indicate that there is um, some resources that have been shared in the Q&A chat, including some good practices that can be drawn on for others. And I know, Sangeeta, you said you would drop your report in there as well. We are happy to follow up with participants to share links to these resources. Um, I know it has been a very technical, a very rich conversation this last hour and a half, so I'm very grateful to everyone for their contributions. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch. This is very much an ongoing and emerging, uh, well, not necessarily emerging, but evolving issue that's been ongoing. And we're very keen to see how the changes to Recommendation 8 continue to play out in the next evaluation cycle. Um, so if there's anything that we can be of assistance or anyone wants to follow up with questions, please feel free to do so with us or with any of the panelists. Thank you to our great set of experts today for joining us from all different parts of the world. I know time zones are always tricky, but very grateful that you were willing to make time and share with us today. We look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, everyone.